In the context of admissions to our elite universities and graduate schools, is it time to end affirmative action? First, affirmative action is a euphemism for admitting blacks and Hispanics to selective universities despite wide gaps in SAT scores and grades. Discriminating on the basis of race is inherently unfair and offensive, particularly when it's done by governments. The beneficiaries of affirmative action are not the truly disadvantaged. They are most... Affirmative action is one of the biggest causes for anger being wrongly directed toward the black community. The prevailing belief is that qualified white people are having their jobs taken away from them by dumb, lazy black people. This is actually part of a larger mythology called the social parasite theory. This prevailing belief is that black people play the role of a leech or parasite to society and that blacks are sucking the lifeblood out of white society primarily by taking jobs that they don't deserve and receiving money that they didn't work for. At the very core of this belief is the idea that white people are being held back from having their perfect white society because non-whites keep messing everything up. This video will focus on the white supremacist mythology surrounding affirmative action. The affirmative action myth is that intelligent, hard-working, and well-trained white people are losing their jobs and university acceptances to unqualified black people. It is very important to remember that the social reaching perspective does not come from observation of actual events. It is entirely based on political rhetoric. In other words, it is a perceived threat rather than an actual problem. Every year, thousands of white people get rejected from prestigious universities. After receiving their rejection notices in the mail, many of them immediately begin to fantasize that an unqualified black person got accepted over them. This is their perception, yet it does not match reality. In September 2007, the Boston Globe newspaper reported on research done by ETS. The company did a study on the top 146 colleges in the United States. They compared each school's requirements to the actual admissions statistics. Student qualifications included GPA, standardized test scores, and letters of recommendation. The study found that white people with a bad GPA, poor standardized test scores, and weak letters of recommendation were actually more likely to be found on these top 146 college campuses than minorities who depended on affirmative action. In fact, unqualified white people are nearly twice as numerous at these universities than their equally unqualified minority counterparts. These findings represent and reflect the trends of many colleges across the United States and Europe. This fact completely contradicts the myths about affirmative action and university acceptances. In addition to the study, Decades of sociological research combined with labor statistics reveal that it is actually the white woman who is the largest beneficiary of affirmative action. This means that the primary effect of affirmative action is resources going from the white community to the white community. Now, it is not a problem for the white community to give itself resources. The problem is all of the misdirected anger, animosity, and blame going toward black people. This is not an accident. The system was designed to preserve white wealth while maintaining the myth that America is somehow a land of equal opportunity. Ironically, many of the politicians who hated black people actually became very involved with the civil rights movement and the development of its legal foundation. This worked out perfectly for white supremacy because many people feared that the black community would gain more power once legal restrictions against blacks had been lifted. The key issue at hand was the concept of minority. This is because the definition of words like minority had a huge effect on how social programs would influence the allocation of resources. In the early 1960s, the concept of minority was defined based on ethnicity, religion, and national origin. 
Everybody knew that it was ridiculous to call white women a minority according to any definition. For example, if minority is defined in terms of quantity, then white women are not a minority because they belong to the most numerous gender and also the most numerous race of people in America. If minority is defined in terms of the workforce, then that would not make sense during an age when domestic jobs were the norm for women. Women were not expected to populate the workforce in high numbers anyway. If minority is defined in terms of access to resources, then white women are still not a minority because the resources are held by the white woman's father, husband, uncle, brother, and son. White men and white women don't live in two separate communities. They live in the same communities and they share the same resources. Therefore, white women are not a minority in any sense of the word. So this raises the question of why white women legally became minorities in the first place. In the late 1950s, there was a growing fear that civil rights would eventually lead to resources being channeled into the black community. Congressman Howard Smith of Virginia was one of many politicians working to make sure that this would never happen. For example, he actively blocked civil rights legislation in 1957, declaring that, quote, the Southern people have never accepted the colored race as a race of people who has equal intelligence as the white people of the South. He continued to fight against civil rights legislation for many years. In 1964, Congressman Howard Smith offered a bill that would add gender to the list of discriminations. To push this amendment, he brought in a made-up letter supposedly written by a woman. As he read the letter out loud, the other congressmen thought it was ridiculous and the chambers of Congress filled up with laughter. Later, Representative Carl Elliott from Alabama stated, Smith didn't give a damn about women's rights. The fact of the matter is, the white woman's liberation movement created a way where white wealth could be preserved along with the American myth of equal opportunity. Affirmative action is practiced in a way that mostly benefits the white population, and it is talked about in a way that redirects anger toward the black population. This is the nature of American politics. Real politics always operates on a street level and has a grassroots agenda. Real affirmative action happens when the black community affirms its own power and takes direct action within itself. America's help will never be a match to knowledge of self. Peace.